This week we consider step five of the integrative bargaining roadmap. You'll recall we started at step one, which was being intentional about going below the line, taking the conversation in a different direction. We then followed that with step two, which was asking really good questions, open-ended questions like a counselor would ask. Step three is to listen. Listen for the unstated and be very, very careful about how we listen and be sure we do so in such a way that we invite people to share information. Step four, which we talked about last week, was getting creative and creating options that could be the solution to our challenge or the key to getting the deal put together. Step five, well, it's really simple. It comes down to one question, and that is considering all of the options that we've created, asking the question for each option, is it doable? Can it be done? Is it feasible? This is a really, really important question, and it will help us filter all of the different options that are now on the table. Now, it's really important that we don't start this process until we get the options on the table. We want to make sure the whiteboard is full before we start eliminating any options based on the fact that they're not doable. Let me share with you a quick story about someone I know who didn't think an option was doable, but then later learned that it actually was. To his surprise, it turned out to be the difference in his success. This story comes from an insurance adjuster. This particular gentleman, he had a claim that came in. It was a lady that was rear-ended by one of his insureds. Her car was totaled. This was a lady that was a widow. She had not been widowed very long, and she had this horrific car accident to where now all of a sudden she was without transportation. Now you know what happens in moments like this where a car is totaled. The insurance company is going to bring you a check as opposed to repairing your car, and that's what happened here. This particular gentleman went out to her house. He explained the process to her. He presented the check, which was for a very fair amount for her car, including some additional monies for inconvenience and pain and suffering. And he asked her to sign a release. The lady wouldn't sign the release. So he did what you would intuitively think to do. He went back to his manager and he got more authority on the file and so he went out with an even larger check and yet he had the same outcome. So finally, he looked across the table at the lady and he began to ask questions. He began to go below the line. And he said, ma'am, I'm bringing you a very fair amount of money. Help me understand what you're looking to get out of this. She looked across the table at him and she says, you need to understand. She goes, I got married when I was 18 years old. My husband died a few years ago. She goes, I have never been to a car dealership in my entire life. I've never purchased a car. I don't know how to purchase a car. I don't know if it's a good deal or if it's a bad deal. She says, frankly, the whole experience just frightens me to death. So this particular insurance adjuster, he knew the challenge he had. He knew he had to figure out how to help this lady buy a car. And so he began by asking her, ma'am, help me understand what kind of car might you want? The lady walked over to her living room and she pulled over the curtain and she looked outside at his company car. It was an old Ford Taurus, not a very nice car at all. She looked out and she said, well, that looks like a nice car. I want a car just like that. And then she turned to him and said, can I just have that car? Now, as the gentleman tells the story, he says very selfishly, I thought for a second and said, well, wait a minute. If she got my car, that means that I would get a new car. And so it motivated him just enough to go ask whether or not that was doable. He had no hopes that it would be. Didn't think in a million years he could pull that off, but he went and asked his manager. This financially makes sense for the company. Can I literally sign over title to the company car in satisfaction of this claim? He thought his manager would reject it outright, but instead his manager said, well, we don't typically do that, but call Fleet Services and let's see if we can. So the gentleman called Fleet Services, and to his surprise, he found out that he had to fill out a couple of pieces of paperwork and that he could, in fact, turn over title to the company car in satisfaction of the claim. They got all the paperwork done. He was driving back out to her house, and he said, you know, I felt so good about the deal 
that I wanted to do something really nice for her. So I stopped and I literally got the car completely detailed so she would have a brand new car. He drove it up to her driveway. She came out really excited. He presented the keys and she in turn signed the release. Now what's so interesting when I tell this story is that many people that I tell this story to, their first instinct is this. They say that would never happen in my company. We don't do things that creative or we have this policy that prevents us from doing things. Notice immediately where our heads go. Immediately our reaction is no, we can't do that. There's too much risk. That would never happen. That was the same reaction that this particular insurance adjuster had, but guess what? In this particular case, he was wrong. It was doable. He could do it, and because of that, he experienced a great level of success with this particular claim. And so, as you think about all of the options that are available that result from this going below the line process, I hope you'll think carefully and critically about which ones are doable. But in saying that, I hope you'll think carefully and critically about the options that can be achieved because it's in those options where you can find your next level of success.